Hello and welcome to Redlands Community Church Sunday School. This is the, the Youth Ministry Sunday School, but of course everybody's welcome. Get out your Bibles. We're continuing our section in Threads of Inspiration. We've been looking at creeds and confessions and ones that are built into the scriptures. The church has other creeds and confessions that we've developed over the years, and especially the, the early church as they were kind of getting founded and figuring out what it is that, that they believe and being able to teach that in, a, in an easy to remember package. And so they were doing that from the very beginning and those creeds, many of them got worked right into the scriptures. And so that's what we're studying now. Today we're going to look at Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 through 11 and it's a very interesting creed in that it was developed to teach one thing and now it's being used in Philippians chapter 2 to as an illustration to teach another. So that's fascinating as we look at it. But the context of Philippians chapter 2 is the Philippians are being encouraged to love one another to love one another deeply, to put each other ahead of themselves. And so we see our title slide here with Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. So let's go ahead and pray. We'll take another quick look at what we mean when we say creed or confession, and then we'll jump into Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Lord, as we look at your word, we know that it is inspired by you. And as we read through it, Lord, we try to, to think, what would you have us do? What would you have us be? And what would you have us think as we look into that word as we apply that word in our lives. And so we ask, Lord, that you would teach us today as we look at this creed in Philippians 2, 5 through 11, and that in doing that, Lord, we would take it to heart, take it to mind, and live it. And, Lord, that you would be glorified in all of this. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so creed or confession, a brief statement of our beliefs as Christians. And that can be something like a doctrinal statement that we have at the church. You can look that up online and it goes through 12 very succinct statements about what it is that we believe. And so you can get a version of that that has the scriptures attached to it. So you can see that we pulled that out of the scriptures and didn't just make it up. A confession would be to vocally proclaim that which we believe, which we understand to be true. And so, for example, Romans 10, 9, and 10, which we've already covered, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, then we will be saved. And so that's the kind of idea with creeds and confessions. So this creed, this in Philippians chapter 2, Paul is writing to the Philippians and he's trying to give them, get them to have an attitude of selflessness, an attitude of putting the other guy first. And so that's what we see here as it begins in Philippians 2.5. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus. And here's the cool part about this, is that then to present the example of Jesus Christ as our model of having an attitude of, of putting the other guy first, of being a servant, of emptying ourselves and doing that for the benefit of others, that in that we are also taught an enormous amount about the theological nature of Christ and what he has done to purchase our pardon that we might live freely and forgiven before him and before God. And also what brings about his supremacy as creator, but then also as savior. So this is a creed that was obviously circulating around in the early church before it was written down here. And so Paul is using that common confession, that common creed, that common saying that the early church was speaking to use as an illustration for the Philippian church so that they would pick it up right away and understand what it was he was saying because this is something that was already familiar to them. And so then he can set it before them as an example. So have this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, 
who, although he existed in the form of God, did not require or did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped or held on to, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant and being found in the likeness of human beings, of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. So take a look at this and see how it, it kind of works its way through that he was in the form of God, but he didn't require it something to be grasped or held onto. And so then he took on the form of a bond servant and humbled himself. And then in that form, then he became obedient as a man, even to the point of death. So we have this way of working our way through. And we've got a couple of statements in each section that that support one another. So Christ Jesus existed in the form of God, but he didn't in, in regard that as something to be held on to. He emptied himself. He took the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of, of man, being found in that likeness, then he became obedient. And so we have these couplets that go down through that would make it easier to understand and easier to remember. So let's take them kind of one at a time and work our way through here. And then at the end, we'll look at the result of that, because this is what, what Christ Jesus is doing. And this is the first part of it. And then in 9 through 11, we see what God the Father is doing in response to what Jesus Christ, God the Son, is doing in the first part. And what what Jesus Christ is doing in the first part, God the Son is doing in the first part, is again, remember, an example to us that we would empty ourselves as well. So let's take a look at him. Christ Jesus, although he existed in the form of God, did not require equal or regard, I keep saying that require, regard equality with God a thing to be held on to or, or, or to gra be grasped, uh, but that he was willing to let go of that for a time, even though he he still is God and he's but now he's taken on the form of a man. So there's a lot of, of controversy over this. Or try, people trying to say, well, what is it exactly that he's talking about? Well, the form, morphe, is the Greek word. It really means the essence, the that he is Almighty God. And we've got a couple of, there's a lot of verses, we've, and we've talked about this before, but I'm going to show you a couple of them that would denote Jesus Christ as God. John, they're both in John. One's in 5, in chapter 5, verse 18. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but he was also calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. If anybody ever tells you, well, Jesus never claimed to be God, ask them, then why did, the, why did they have him killed? Why did the Jews call for him to be executed? The purpose or the reason for the execution was blasphemy that Jesus was claiming to be God. And of course, it's not blasphemy because what he was claiming is true, right? And so if we as mere men or women claim to be God, that would be blasphemy. That would not be true. But with Jesus, it is true. But they, nobody can say that he didn't claim to be God and adequately answer the, the question of, well, then why did the Jews ask the you know, Pilate to kill him. You just can't get there. Okay. And then in John chapter 10, the Jews answered Jesus. No, it's not because he said, why are you stoning me? For what good work that I've done are you trying to kill me? And they said, no, it's not for a good work that we stone you, but for blasphemy because you being a man, make yourself out to be God. Again, they themselves saying they recognized his claim to deity, his claim to be almighty God. And so they went to execute him. Okay, so he existed in the form of God, but he didn't require that or regard that as something to be held on to. But then he emptied himself, taking the form of a bond servant, taking the form of a human being. There we go. Uh, being found in appearance as a man. And we know this also from John and, and from Colossians. The, the word became flesh and he made his dwelling among us and we saw his glory the glory of the only begotten from the father full of grace and truth and in colossians 2 9 christ 
in all the for in Christ all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. So this is his taking on flesh, take in and limiting himself in the flesh to to be in one place at one time, to experiencing the temptations that we have in the flesh, and yet was without sin. So and then humbling himself, emptied himself, and he also humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And we can see a demonstration of this obedience as Jesus is praying in the garden and he's asking, Lord, if this cup can be taken from me, you know, please take it away. And yet, not as I will, but as you will. Okay, so he's he's saying that this is something that that he would rather not have happen, but he's going to be obedient to God the Father and to his will. And so this is the example that's being given to the Philippian church in living selflessly and living for one another. That the Christ would not desire to hold on to a high office or a high position, okay, being in very nature God. He didn't need to hold on to that position, but yet he would take on the form of a servant and that in the form of a servant, then he would become obedient even to death. And that's the example that he gives. And you think, well, wait a minute, how can we follow that example as mere human beings? Well, we can certainly give up any claim that we have to to power or to authority and yet see that we have responsibilities before Christ. And we can take on the nature of a servant and we can become obedient. And we can't die for the sins of the world, but we can certainly die to self to the point where we put others ahead of ourselves and in that build a unity in the body that leads others to that joy and that community and leads others to Christ who created that community and that joy. That's what he calls us to do and that's why we have that exhortation. So we're learning about Christ and we're learning some amazing things about him and then we're also learning about ourselves and how we must emulate the selflessness of our Lord, of God the Son. And so then we have God the Father steps in and responds to all of this. Jesus emptied himself, he humbled himself, and he was obedient. We empty ourselves, we give up any claim we have to power over others, we humble ourselves, become servants for one another, and are obedient to our Lord, even to the point of death, because we know that in him and being obedient to him that therein lies true life so god the father responds to the selflessness of god the son by exalting him for this reason also god highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name so that at the name of jesus every knee will bow Those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So God the Father sent God the Son. God the Son took on flesh, humbled himself, became obedient, and because of that, then he was exalted. And this is another thing that we can understand in our example, that he who exalts himself, then he's going to get knocked down. But if we humble ourselves then it will be God is the one who raises us up. And that's our final slide here. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, Jesus says, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And of course, he made himself the ultimate example of that. So go ahead and read through Philippians and then read again through Philippians chapter 2 and then read again through uh, Philippians chapter 2, 5 through 11. And you'll see that in all of these things that we have this example in Christ that we can follow. And in that example, we can learn so much about him, but also about ourselves. And that's the the next step in our creeds of Christianity that we find in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. God bless you. Have a great week. Exalt God. Humble yourself. Be a servant. Be obedient to God this week and see how putting that into practice draws us all together in the unity that God calls us to be. So God bless you. We'll catch you next week.